Hello, this is another one of my videos on Shiism, this one dealing with Hamid Algar's take on the Usuli Akhbari conflict. I'm using here uh, Hamid Algar's uh, long essay on Shiism in Iran since the satellites, so I'm just going to talk about a small part of the, the long essay. The essay was originally uh, published in 2006 and last updated in 2012, the articles in print and also online. Uh, Hamid Algar himself is the Professor Emeritus of Persian Studies at the Faculty of Near Eastern Studies at the University of California in Berkeley. And he has numerous publications, which uh, particularly include here of relevance, his book, Religion and State in Iran from 1785 to 1906. Uh, published by uh, University of California Press in 1969. Uh, as a small aside, I notice he always likes to use the term Persia, whereas I tend to use the term Iran, so you may find some divergence there. Do read his article, however, it's very well worth reading and uh, filled with lots of interesting information. A significant difference between the Shi ulama of Safavid Iran related to the very methodology of their discipline. Rationalist and traditionalist currents had both long existed in Shi jurisprudence, and by the Saljuk period, they had come to be designated as Usuli and Akhbari, respectively. The Usulis espoused the permissibility even the necessity of recourse to juristic exertion, that's edged to hard, for the deduction of detailed religious rulings from the sources of the Sharia during the continued occultation of the 12th Imam. By contrast, the Akhbaris laid heavy emphasis on the primary or even exclusive evidentiary value of the traditions, that's the Akhbar, of the Prophet and the Imams. This division of learned opinion should not, however, be regarded as even approximately similar to that which had opposed the Hanafi and Shafi'i uh, Sunni law schools in pre safavid Iran, although Akhbaris polemically accused the Asunis of surreptitiously borrowing from the Hanafites. The word mazhab, therefore, cannot be applied to these two traditions of Shi jurisprudence. For whatever the historical reality that had played out in the cities of Iran, the Hanafis and Shafis extended to each other a theoretical recognition of legitimacy, a situation that simply didn't obtain between the Usulis and the Akhbaris, each group identifying their own position as the perennially authentic doctrine of Shiism and regarding that of the other as an innovation. Moreover, the divide between the contesting tendencies in Xi jurisprudence had no demographic reflection. Cities were not separated into localities, owing allegiance to one or the other of these two viewpoints. During the Safavid period, the Akhbaris were dominant. It was in the Safavid period that Usuli Akhbari polemics came acrimoniously to the fore. Doubtless because the ulama were now involved for the first time in ministering to a demographically significant population. Mullah Muhammad Amin Ashtabadi provided a comprehensive statement of the Akhbari position in one of his works. The book became a target for several refutations, and its author was accused of introducing strife into the Shi community. Nevertheless, the Akhbari position enjoyed supremacy throughout the 17th and much of the 18th centuries, and many of the most eminent uh, clerics of the period adhered to it, albeit with varying degrees of emphasis, as with the men listed here. The prominence of the Akhbaris was also reflected in the compilation of voluminous collections of Shi Hadith at this time. Then we have the interregnum of the 18th century. The destruction of the Safavid state by Afghan invaders in 1722 
served to demonstrate the most signal accomplishment of the Safavid dynasty, that is, the conversion of the great majority of Iranians to Shiism. For despite a lack of significant state endorsement for three decades or more, Shiism survived as the distinctive quasi-national creed of Iran. Esfahan, however, lost its allure as a major intellectual center of the Shi'i world, largely because of the devastation wrought by the Afghan invaders, and the focus of scholarly activity shifted then to the Atabat, the shrine cities of Iraq, including Najaf, where you have the shrine of the Imam Ali, and Karbala, where you have the shrine of the Imam Hussein. Then you have the substantial challenge mounted by the new Shah of a reunified Iran, Nader Shah Afshar, who elevated himself to the throne of Iran in 1736 and abandoned the pretense of loyalty to a Safavid claimant and declared that his exercise of kingship was to be dependent on the abandonment by his subjects of Shiism as it was then practiced. None of this came to pass, however. None of the significant Shi scholars of the age were involved in Nader Shah's project, and it died uh, with him. Far more important than Nader Shah's attempted revision of Shiism was the ultimate triumph of the Asuli current in jurisprudence over its Akbari rival. Thanks to the devastation brought by the Afghans and to Nader Shah's expropriation of the endowments, the Alkaf, that supported the city scholars, Esfahan had lost its primacy as the intellectual centre of the Shi'i world. It was therefore the, to the Atbat that the final stages of the conflict were played out. Initially, the Akbaris prevailed, but this was not to last long. The decisive uh, vindication of the Osili position was largely the work of a single scholar, Muhammad Bakr Bahani, known as the unique uh, Wahid uh, in token of his achievement. Uh, he died sometime in the 70, early 1790s and was born in the early 1700s. Uh, born in Esfahan, he left for Najaf with his father after the Afghan invasion and came there under the influence of Akhbari teachers. Perhaps a decade later, he moved to Behbahan, a town in southwest Iran, relatively immune to the instability prevalent elsewhere in the country. During a residence of some 30 years, he reverted to a fully-fledged Asuli position and engaged in polemics with the local Akhbaris. This was but a prelude to the campaign he waged after his return to Iraq, which ended in the defeat of the Akhwaris and the rallying to the Usuli position of some of the most prominent amongst them. This, the means that Behbahani employed, were primarily those of written argumentation and debate. But another factor was that the plague that ravaged Iraq in 1772 also contributed whilst the Usulis regarded it as permissible to flee temporarily to unaffected areas, the Akhwaris tended to remain behind, with fatal consequences for them. Reduced to its essentials, Bahani's formulation of the Usuli position affirms the necessity of Ejtahad, that's disciplined reasoning based on the sources of the Sharia, as a source of guidance for the community during the continued occultation of the 12th Imam. Thus, believers fall into two types. Those who have attained the technical qualifications required for the exercise of Ejtahad, these are the Mujtahids, and those who haven't. These latter are religiously obligated to follow the rulings of the Mujtahids, a process known as Taklid imitation. A Mujtahid selected for Taklid is known as uh, Maja Taklid, a source of imitation. This twofold division of the Shi community plainly results in a higher degree of authority for the religious scholars than that implied by the Akbari position, which makes them little more than experts in Hadith. Since the matters 
on which guidance is sought or proffered are in the first place newly occurring situations and problems, the authority exercised by the Mujahid may also embrace the political sphere. Hence, the increasingly visible political role of the ulama in the Qajar period and beyond, uh, not only in Tehran, but also major provincial cities such as Tabriz and Esfahan. More numerous and significant were the clashes that occurred during the long reign of Nasruddin Shah, uh, who was in power from 1848 to 1896, witnessed the beginnings of the processes that were perceived as a threat to the integrity of uh, Perso Islamic society, foreign encro encroachment, widening prerogatives of the state, and the degree of westernization. At the same time, the methodology of Usuli jurisprudence was additionally refined in a way that further enhanced the authority of the Ulama. It was propounded that the common believer choose as his source of imitation, a Mojda had judged to be more learned alam than all his colleagues. Such comparative evaluations of erudition were, of course, beyond the capacity of the common believer, and the emergence of a Mojda head as more learned tended to be the result of a general reputation for piety and the promotion of his claims by lesser ranking ulama associated with him. So we have this question of whether there should be a supreme Majatak lead, a supreme center of imitation. Uh, the first Mojda has to be generally accepted as Alam and therefore deserving the tak lead of the entire community were Sheikh Muhammad Hassan al Najafi, who died in 1850, and more notably Sheikh Mutasa Ansari, who died in 1864. Neither of these had the occasion or the inclination to make political use of their power implicit in their position. But it was Ansari's foremost pupil and successor, Mirza Hassan Shirazi, who died in 1895, and was adorned with the honorific Mujadid, the renewer, who issued in 1901 the celebrated fatwa that forbade the consumption of tobacco as long as its marketing was in the hands of a British monopoly universally obeyed and resulting in violent clashes in the capital and elsewhere, this fatwa and the reaction to roused marked the beginning of mass politics in Iran. Shirazi did not, however, allow his authority to be mobilized for more ambitious purposes, and the ulama in general had as yet no interest in a comprehensive reshaping of the political order under its leadership. Once the Usuli cause had found in Iran, with its manifold long-term socio-political consequences, the Akhbari tendency became effectively confined to Khuzestan in the southwest and the Shi'i communities of Bahrain and Al-Assar on the southern shores of the Persian Gulf. So many thanks for listening, and particular thanks to my patrons, without whose support I wouldn't be able to make these videos. You're very welcome to support my channel. Please do like, comment and share on the videos. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. I'll give Patreon and PayPal links below in case you want to provide practical support. Next week, uh, I'm beginning a series of videos on the Shafi uh, movement. Uh, have a good day.